Now, the number system that we're used to using in everyday life is called the real numbers. The real numbers, they span from minus infinity to plus infinity with everything in between. Now, one of the things that makes the real numbers so useful is that we can always add, subtract, multiply, and divide any two real numbers. So you might ask, well, what kinds of number systems could there be out there which generalize the real numbers, whereby you can always add, subtract, multiply, and divide? Well, it turns out that there's only four of these very special number systems. They're called the real numbers, the complex numbers, the quaternions, and the octonions. Now, the real numbers, they're used pretty much everywhere in physics, and uh, they were believed to have been discovered by at least 500 BC. Now, it took roughly 2,000 years before an Italian mathematician named Cardano came to discover the complex numbers. But it's a good thing that he did, because the complex numbers ended up being central to this revolutionary new theory in physics. Now, by the mid-1800s, Gauss and then Hamilton found the quaternions. And it's fairly straightforward to show that the quaternions underlie the structure of Einstein's special relativity. Now, the same year that the quaternions were found, so were the octonions. But in the 174 years since they were discovered, the octonions have not been found to be central to any major theory in physics. It's a little hard to believe, though, that nature would rely so heavily on the first three of these number systems, and yet that it would forget about the fourth. So the way this talk is going to run is as follows. We're going to start with the complex quaternions. And we're going to see that they give Lorentzian degrees of freedom, so things like spin and chirality. And then we're going to look at the complex octonions. And we're going to find that these give other internal degrees of freedom, so things like color and electric charge. So we're going to start with the complex quaternions, and we're going to find that they give a faithful representation of a Clifford algebra. And once we have a Clifford algebra, we're pretty much home free, because from here we know how to build spinners. So we're going to use a spinner construction, and we're going to find that we get left and right-handed vial spinners. And then we're going to repeat the process, this time using the complex octonions. So we're going to find that they give, that they lead to a Clifford algebra. And then we're going to use the same spinner construction as before, except this time what are we going to get? Well, the idea is that this time we're going to get quarks and leptons. In the process, we're going to be able to introduce a new electric charge operator, Q. This Q is special because it's going to offer us a straightforward explanation as to why electric charge is quantized. OK, so just to summarize, we're going to start with these algebras. We're going to see that they lead to Clifford algebras. And then we're going to use a spinner construction. In this case, we're going to find that we get left and right-handed vial spinners. And in this case, we're going to find that we get one full generation of quarks and leptons under SU3 cross U1. So let's start by taking a look at the complex quaternions. So any element out of this algebra can be written as a real linear combination of these eight objects. There's the number one. There's the complex I. There's a quaternionic I, J, K. And then there's I times I, I times J, and I times K. So this is the complex I that you're used to dealing with all the time, and it commutes with everything in the algebra. And now these are the quaternionic I, J, K, 
So if I'm, they're imaginary units. If I multiply one of these by itself, then it gives me minus one. And if I multiply them with each other, then they obey these multiplication rules. So this tells me that i times j gives k, j times k gives i, k times i gives j, and if I go against the arrows, then we get a negative sign. So j times i is minus k. So I can use these multiplication rules to show some commutation relations which should be familiar. For example, which should look like the Pauli matrices. And in fact, it turns out that I can identify ii with sigma x, ij with sigma y, and ik with sigma z. So that these three objects here generate rotations. Similarly, using these multiplication rules, I can show that these three objects generate boosts. And finally, I can show that these six objects here generate the Lorentz algebra. So if I were to now take a real linear combination of these six objects, let me call that S, and I multiply it by complex I and exponentiate the whole thing. And this gives me an element of SL2C. Now before I move on, there are three conjugates which I'm gonna to have to tell you about, which will be important for us. So the first one is the complex conjugate. This just is the complex conjugate that you're used to dealing with all the time. It maps the complex i to minus i. Then there's what we're going to call the quaternionic conjugate. And that's given by a tilde over top of the variable. And that takes quaternionic i j k to minus i j k. I should also mention that the quaternionic conjugate also reverses the order of multiplication. So that means that if I have a times b, all tilde, that's given by b tilde, a tilde. And finally, there's going to be what we call the Hermitian conjugate. And that does both of these two things at the same time. All right, so just to summarize, Using just the algebra of the complex quaternions, we're able to write down elements of SL2C. And then finally, we introduced three different kinds of conjugates here for this algebra. The first one is the complex conjugate. The second one is a quaternionic conjugate. And the final one is what we're going to call the Hermitian conjugate. Now, it turns out that the complex quaternions give a faithful representation of the Clifford algebra CL2. So here at the bottom, we have the identity, which is just the zero vector. On the next level, we have i and j, which are the one vectors, or in other words, our generating space. And at the top, we have i times j, which is our bivector, which gives k. Now you can see that this is a Clifford algebra in the sense that if I were to relabel this as gamma 1 and this one is gamma 2, then under anti-commutation we see that we have this relation. Now it turns out that I can rewrite this generating space in terms of a new basis. So let me define alpha like this. 
an alpha dagger like this. Now look what happens under this change of bases. That is, alpha and alpha dagger behave like fermionic raising and lowering operators. Finally, we can write down a number operator in the usual way. But of course, we only have one alpha and one alpha dagger, so this number operator only has one term in it. Now you might ask, why do we care about Clifford algebras? That is, why do we care that the complex quaternions give a faithful representation of a Clifford algebra? Now we care about Clifford algebras because spinners can be defined as minimal left ideals of Clifford algebras. So just to remind you about what an ideal is, let's say we're to have some algebra A. Then an ideal is a subalgebra, whereby if I were to take some element out of the ideal, and I were to multiply it by any element out of the algebra, it doesn't matter which one it is, then their product will necessarily get pulled back inside the ideal. So loosely speaking, you can think of an ideal as an algebra's version of a black hole. in that it will pull any element into itself via multiplication. Now, a minimal left ideal is a left ideal that has no non-trivial ideals inside it. So let's see what happens when we take our algebra A to be the complex quaternions. What are we going to get as minimal left ideals? So now we're gonna build minimal left ideals using the complex quaternions. And we're gonna do this following, loosely following a procedure which is laid out in a review paper by Abramovitz. So the first step in this procedure is to introduce a projector V. So V is an idempotent, and we're going to define it as alpha alpha dagger. Now it turns out that this, this projector is going to act a little bit like a vacuum state. So the way to get this minimal left ideal is we take our Clifford algebra, or in other words C cross H, and we left multiply it onto V. So this is the minimal left ideal. Now it turns out when we do this, we get a two complex dimensional space, which is spanned by V and alpha dagger V. So you can see this looks a little bit like a Fox space. It's not a very big Fox space because there's only one alpha dagger here. So let's say we're to now, uh, let's say I now wanted to identify what these things are physically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to left multiply by the operator i k over 2, which of course is just like sigma z over 2. And when I do that, I find that this basis vector has got eigenvalue plus 1 half. And this one here has eigenvalue minus 1 half. So that's going to allow me to identify this first one as spin up and the second one as spin down. 
So these are just complex coefficients. Now I'm going to identify the whole thing as a left-handed vial spinner. So now if I were to take that SL2C element that we constructed on the previous board and I left multiply it onto psi L, and we watch how these coefficients transform, then we find that this thing transforms as a left-handed vial spinner would under SL2C. Now the complex Clifford algebra CL2 has just a single irreducible representation. But I didn't need to build it like this. I could have built it in a different way. So I could have left multiplied C cross H onto V star instead, the complex conjugate of V. And when I do that, I find that I get a new space which is linearly independent from the first. And this one is spanned by the basis vectors V star and alpha V star. Then when I apply this um, sigma z operator onto these basis vectors, I find that this one is spin down and this one is spin up. And we're going to identify this as a right-handed vial spinner. In fact, if I were to left multiply L star onto psi r, and we watch how these coefficients transform, then we find that this transforms as does a right-handed vial spinner under SL2C. Okay, so just to summarize, we started with the algebra of the complex quaternions. We saw that it gave a faithful representation of the Clifford algebra CL2. And then we use a spinner construction to build what we identify as a left-handed vial spinner or alternately, we can use it to identify, um, to build what we identify as a right-handed vial spinner. Now finally, the last thing I want to mention is that you'll notice that these two spaces are related simply by the complex conjugate. So that means that in this formalism, we can relate left and right-handed vial spinners using nothing more than the complex conjugate. That's just i to minus i. So we just showed that the complex quaternion split into two pieces. Left and right-handed vial spinners. So the left-handed spinner transforms like this. And the right-handed spinner transforms like this. So one thing to notice here is that we're not talking about a matrix acting on a column vector. Instead, this is always just an algebra acting on itself. So this is just the complex quaternions acting on the complex quaternions. So from here, it's really easy to write down Dirac spinners. It's just going to be the sum of these two things. And a Majorana spinner is also easy to define. It's given by a Dirac spinner plus or minus its complex conjugate. But it turns out that we can model more than just spinners using the complex quaternions. We can also model four vectors. So this time the complex quaternions split in a different way and we get two four vectors. So a contravariant four vector transforms like this. And its covariant counterpart is simply given by the complex conjugate of this. So this is something that might actually look familiar to you. We often write down four vectors in terms of two by two matrices.
finally, we can do this one last time. We can split the complex quaternions into two pieces. And this time, we're going to get a spinner, a scalar, and a field string tensor. So the scalar transforms like this. But the scalar happens to be just a complex number, so it commutes with everything and it comes out. Now this L and L tilde happen to be inverses of each other, so they cancel, and this is in fact a scalar. Now finally, the field string tensor transforms like this. So just to summarize, Using just the algebra of the complex quaternions, we're able to describe left and right-handed vial spinners, Dirac spinners, Majorana spinners, contravariant and covariant four vectors, scalars, and the field string tensor. Put all together, what is this? This is all of the Lorentz representations of the standard model. So that's what we can do with the complex quaternions. So we might ask, well, what can we do with the complex octonions? So any element of this algebra can be written like this. Where the c's here are complex coefficients, and the e's are imaginary units. So if I multiply one of those by itself, it gives me minus 1. And now if I multiply these with each other, then they obey these multiplication rules. So the way to read this diagram is as follows. You'll notice that the diagram has all kinds of line segments going through it. So here's a line segment with three imaginary units on it. Here's a line segment with three imaginary units on it. And this circle is also considered a line segment. It's got three imaginary units on it. So every time we have one of these line segments with three imaginary units on it, we have to treat it as if it's a quaternionic triple. So you remember the quaternions had the multiplication rules. like this, where we had i times j gives k, j times k gives i, and then if you go against the arrows, you get a negative sign, so you get k times j is minus i. Um, so let's just look at an example here. So there's this line segment down the right-hand side. We see that we have three imaginary units on it. So you have to pretend like that's a quaternionic triple. So we imagine that this is actually a loop, which is connected around the back. And so this tells us that E6 times E1 gives E5, E1 times E5 gives E6, E5 times E6 gives E1, and if you go against the arrows, you get a negative sign. So E5 times E1 gives minus E6. So we can use these multiplication rules to show some fairly peculiar properties of the octonion's multiplication. So let's look at, at an example. So let's look at E3, E4, and E2. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to consider this with the brackets like this, and we're going to compare it to what happens when we have the brackets like this. So starting on this side, we have E3 times E4. So that's given by E6. And then we have E6 times E2. That's minus E7. And now on the right-hand side, when we take E4, times E2, that's minus E1. And now E3 times E1 is minus E7, but there's already a minus here, so this is plus E7. 
So you see that by just switching the brackets over, we've come up with two completely different answers. So in other words, what we've done is we found an A, a B, and a C in the algebra such that these two things are not equal. So in other words, what we say is that the complex, the complex octonions form a non-associative algebra. So here's where we end up with a problem. We said earlier that we want the complex octonions to lead to a Clifford algebra. But by definition, every Clifford algebra is associative. However, we just showed that the complex octonions are non-associative. Therefore, the complex octonions are not going to give a faithful representation of any Clifford algebra. So now we have the problem that we would like to have an associative algebra, but we've been given the complex octonions. So the question is, how are we going to get around the non-associativity of the octonions? Well, it turns out there's a trick. So let's say we have two elements, m and f, which are just elements of some algebra A. Then I can left multiply m onto f, and that will give me some new f prime, which is also an element of A. In this way, I can think of m as a map from f to f prime. But then I can do this again. So let's say we take an n, which is also an element of a, and we left multiply that onto mf. That'll give us some new f double prime, so that nm is a map from f to f double prime. So I've written an arrow over top of nm here just to show that the multiplication starts at the right and it moves to the left. Now I can continue doing this. So let's take some other element p, also an element of this algebra, and we left multiply it onto nmf. So in this way, we have p n m is a map from f to f triple prime. And we can continue building up these chains. So the trick I'd like to propose here is that instead of uh, considering elements of the algebra A, instead we should be considering the space of maps here. So we'd like to consider the space of maps. And the reason why this might be a good idea is because maps, by definition, are associative. So in other words, f of g of h, like this, is always equal to f of g of h, like this. So let's see what happens when we take our algebra A to be the complex quaternions. So this is the first algebra that we looked at, and it is associative. So that means that for every n, m, and f in the algebra, these two things are always equal. But now we can just rewrite this as uh, m prime, where m prime is just another complex quaternion. So in other words, by building up these chains, I don't get anything new. The space of maps is nothing new. I just ended up with the original algebra again. But this is good, because it means that everything we've done with the complex quaternions can still hold. But now let's see what happens instead when we take our algebra A to be the complex octonions. 
So as we just showed before, this algebra is non-associative. So in other words, there exists an N, an M, and an F such that these two things are not equal. So in other words, this map here is a new map from this map here. And we do get something distinct by building up the space of maps. Now it turns out that the most general left action map of the complex octonions on themselves looks like this. where the c's here are just complex coefficients. Now this means that when we make chains of length four or greater, it means that we can always rewrite them in terms of shorter chains. Now it turns out that these, these octonionic chains have some special properties. So for example, when i is not equal to j, then we have that this is true. And when i is equal to j, we have this. So in other words, these chains of octonions exhibit Clifford algebra structure. Now if we count up all the degrees of freedom of this space of chains, we find that here we've got one complex degree of freedom. Here there are seven complex degrees of freedom. Here there are seven choose two. And here there are seven choose three. So when you add all of these up, we have 64 complex degrees of freedom in total. So it turns out that the, the space of chains of complex octonions um, it can be thought of as being equivalent to the eight by eight complex matrices. Or you can think of them as being equivalent to the endomorphisms on the complex octonions. Or finally, it turns out that they give a faithful representation of the complex Clifford algebra CL6. So in other words, now we have a Clifford algebra. Now we just showed that the complex octonions generate the Clifford algebra CL6. So here we've got the zero vector at the bottom, which is just uh, the unit. And on the next level up, we have E1 to E6. So you might be wondering at this point why we have um, only E1 to E6. I mean, the, uh, the octonions have imaginary units that go up to E7. On the next level up, we have bivectors. And we keep on building up these multivectors till we get to the top. Where we have a six vector. And it so happens that E1 times E2 times E3 times E4 times E5 times E6 gives E7.
So this is where this extra imaginary unit came, uh, went to. So now, of course, E7 isn't special within the octonions. You could have put any of the imaginary units up here. So if I would have put any of the six imaginary units of the octonions in the generating space here, the seventh one will always end up at the top. So now all we have to do is repeat what we did in the case of the complex quaternions, where we had the Clifford algebra CL2. So we're going to rewrite this generating space in terms of a new basis. Now with this new basis, it turns out that the alphas and the alpha daggers behave again like fermionic raising and lowering operators. So it's going to be tedious for us every single time to write down the arrows over top of these operators. So we're just going to emit them from now on. And finally, it's also going to be uh, tedious for us to write down that these equations are true for all f in the complex octonions. So from here on in, we're also, we're also going to emit the f's. So in other words, our equations will just be in terms of the operators from here on in. So now we can write down a number operator in the usual way. And here we've got three alphas and three alpha daggers. So this sum is going to run from one to three. And now finally, it turns out that these ladder operators have a unitary symmetry that acts on them. That symmetry is given by U3. So this U3 will rotate the lowering operators into lowering operators and these raising operators into raising operators. So U3, it turns out, is equal to SU3 cross U1 over Z3. And this, this SU3 is interesting because it happens to be a subgroup of the automorphism group G2 of the octonions. Not only is it a subgroup of G2, but it happens to be the subgroup of G2, which holds one of the imaginary units constant. And this U1 is also interesting because it happens to be generated by our number operator. So now we'd like to build minimal left ideals using the Clifford algebra CL6. So this is going to run exactly as we did before. So the first step that we need to do is we need to build this idempotent or build this projector V. 
So this is how V is going to be defined. And again, this, this projector is going to behave a little bit like a vacuum state. So now to build our minimal left ideal, we do exactly the same as we did before, is we take our Clifford algebra and we left multiply it onto our projector. So we're going to call this SU. Now this minimal left ideal this time turns out to be eight complex dimensional and it's spanned by these basis vectors. And now we can do exactly the same as we did before is that we're going to look at the complex conjugate space. So when we do this, we find again that we get a new space which is linearly independent from the first. And this is spanned by these eight basis vectors. So now we know what basis vectors we have for our two ideals. The question is, how, are these, how do we identify what these things are physically? So in the case of the complex quaternions, we had two basis vectors. We were able to identify those as spin up and spin down states. So we want to know now, how do we identify what these things are physically? Now you remember that we had these raising and lowering operators, the alphas and the alpha daggers, and those transformed under a U3 symmetry, which was SU3 cross U1 over Z3. Now you'll notice that SU and SD are constructed entirely out of alphas and alpha daggers. So that means that the transformations on the latter operators are going to induce transformations on these ideals. So if we start off with SU3, we'll find that that under SU3, this first basis vector transforms as a singlet. We find that these three states here transform into each other as an anti-triplet. These three states here transform into each other as a triplet. And this one at the bottom transforms as a singlet. Moving over here, This one here transforms as a singlet. These three here transform as a triplet. These transform as an anti-triplet. And this one here is a singlet. But this still isn't enough information for us to be able to identify what these things are physically. So let's see how these things transform under the U1 generator that we had. So you remember that our, our U1 generator was the number operator n. So let's see what the, number, what the eigenvalues of this number operator are. So the, the eigenvalues of n are given by 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, and 3 which doesn't look like anything special. That is until you divide it by three. Now we have zero, one third, one third, one third, two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, and one. Well, now those look like electric charges. So let's define our electric charge operator Q to be the number operator divided by 3. And let's see now how this Q acts on our states. So for the first state, we find that this has got a charge 0. For our, second, uh, for our second level here, we find that all three of these states have the same charge, and that charge is one-third. These three states all have the same charge, and that charge is two-thirds. And this one at the bottom has got charge plus one. So you can see how this is a number operator divided by three, in that a number operator is only going to count the number of alpha daggers that we have on each level.
So here we have no alpha daggers, so we get zero charge. Here we have one alpha dagger, so we get one third. Two alpha daggers, two thirds. Three alpha daggers, three thirds. And now we can fill in the charges on the other side. Okay. So now we have enough information to start labeling what we have. So starting here, we have something which is a singlet under SU3 and has got zero charge. Well, that's either a neutrino or an antineutrino. And for a minute, for a reason that will be clear in a minute, um, I'm going to call this neutrino. So this is just a complex coefficient. Now something which is an anti-triplet under SU3 would charge one third. Those are anti-down quarks. Something which is a triplet under SU3 would charge two thirds. Those, those are up quarks. And something which is a singlet under SU3 would charge plus one, that's a positron. Now something which is a singlet under SU3 would charge zero. Again, that's either a neutrino or an antineutrino. And so we're gonna call this antineutrino. Now something which is a triplet under SU3 would charge minus one third, those are down quarks. Something which is an anti-triplet under SU3 would charge minus two thirds, those are anti-up quarks. And finally, something which is a singlet under SU3 would charge minus one, is of course the electron. So we just started with the complex octonions and we had them act on themselves repeatedly. We found that that generated a Clifford algebra CL6. And then we used a Spinner construction to construct SU and SD. And we find that these states transform exactly as would one full generation of standard model particles under the unbroken symmetries SU3 cross U1. So now if I'm allowed to make the assumption that the neutrino goes here and the antineutrino goes here, then we'll notice that SU packaged all of the isospin up type states together and SD packaged all of the isospin down type states together. So we don't have SU2 yet, but it seems that the model knows something about SU2. In particular, if, I'm, if I were to define the object omega to be equal to alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and omega dagger to just be its Hermitian conjugate. And let's say I were to now take this omega and I right multiply it onto the basis vector that corresponds to the neutrino. Then I would find that this object here happens to give me the basis vector for the electron. And this works for every isospin pair. So for example, if I were to right multiply this basis vector by omega for the anti-down quark, I would find that this gives me the basis vector for the anti-up quark. And similarly, if I, were to get, if I were to take omega dagger and I right multiply objects on this side, so for example, the electron, if I were to right multiply this by omega dagger, it would take me back to the basis vector of the neutrino. Um, so finally, I'll mention that uh, when we apply the electric charge operator to these omega and omega dagger, here's what we get. So in other words, omega is negatively charged and omega dagger is positively charged. So we don't have SU2 in this model yet, but you can see that the, w, that the omega and omega dagger seem to have rudimentary behavior of W bosons. So finally, let's summarize some of our results. So we started off with the complex quaternions acting on themselves. 
And we, we found that this gave all of the Lorentz representations of the standard model. Then we were able to copy what we did in the case of left and right handed vial spinners. And we were able to generalize that to build SU and SD using just the complex octoneons acting on themselves. Next, we noted that in order to go between left and right-handed vial spinners, all we needed was the complex conjugate. And similarly, in the case of SU and SD, all we need again is the complex conjugate. For example, if I were to take the basis vector given by this, This corresponds to the positron. And if I were to take the complex conjugate of this, it would give me this basis vector, which corresponds to the basis vector of the uh, electron. So in other words, in this formalism, in order to go to be between particle and antiparticle, all we need is the complex conjugate. Next, in the case of the complex octonions, uh, we introduce these ladder operators, lowering operators and raising operators. And these operators had a U3 symmetry, which rotated lowering operators into lowering operators and raising operators into raising operators. This U3 symmetry is given by SU3 cross U1 over Z3. Which we later identified as SU3 color and electromagnetic U1. So in other words, we have a direct route to the two unbroken gauge symmetries of the standard model. Next, in the case of SU3, We found that the transformations on these ladder operators induce transformations on SU and SD, our two minimal left ideals. And we found that SU under SU3 broke down as a singlet, an anti-triplet, a triplet, and a singlet. And SD broke down like this. So these are exactly the SU3 representations that you would expect for one full generation of quarks and leptons. And finally, we were able to introduce a new electric charge operator, Q. So this Q gave us uh, the correct charges we would expect for one generation. So in other words, zero plus or minus one third, plus or minus two thirds, and plus or minus one. But not only did it give us the correct charges, those charges fit in perfectly with the SU3 representations. So there was no reason to expect these electric charges to fit in with the SU3 representations, but they did. And finally, we were able to uh, define our electric charge operator, Q, as the number operator divided by three. <laughs> 
This offers us a straightforward explanation as to why electric charge is quantized. That is, electric charge is quantized because number operators can only take on integer values. So you may have noticed now in the case of left and right-handed vial spinners, the left and the right-handed vial spinners took up all of the space of the complex quaternions. However, in the case of SU and SD, SU and SD did not take up the entire space, the entire 64-dimensional space of the Clifford algebra CL6, which was generated by the complex octonions. So you might wonder, is there a better way to use up all of the space of this Clifford algebra CL6? So here's our Clifford algebra CL6, which is 64 complex dimensional. This is generated by the complex octonions. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to split this space into two pieces. So the pieces are going to be things of the form A, where this is any element out of this algebra, multiplied onto a projector P, where this P is defined to be 1 plus i e7 over 2. And the bottom space is just going to be any element multiplied onto P star, the complex conjugate of this. So the next thing we can do now is we can identify SU3 generators in these spaces. So it so happens that there's eight SU3 generators of this form in the top half space. So those are going to generate SU3 color. And there's an analogous set of eight in the bottom here. Now what we want to do is we want to take these generators and apply them to the rest of the space. So when we apply these generators to the rest of the space, we find that the top half space breaks down as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We find six singlets under SU3. And in the bottom half space, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 singlets in the bottom half space. And then again here in the bottom, we find that we get 1, 2, 3, 4, five triplets. In the top half space, we find we get one, two, three, four, five triplets under SU3. So you'll notice again that uh, particles and antiparticles are related again simply by the complex conjugate. So these two spaces are related by the complex conjugate, and that's how we match particles and antiparticles. So finally, it turns out that we've got one more antitriplet left over here. And there's one triplet that shows up over here. So I'm not sure if you see immediately what this is. Let's compile a list of what we have here. So if I add up all the triplets that we have, there's five triplets down here, and there's one triplet up here. So we have six triplets under SU3. Those are the SU3 representations we would expect for the up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom quarks. Then there are five antitriplets here and one antitriplet here. So we have six antitriplets in total, which correspond to the, the SU3 representations that we would expect for the anti-up, anti-down, anti-charm, anti-strange, anti-top, and anti-bottom quarks. Then there are six singlets here, which is what we would expect for three neutrinos, and the electron, the muon, and the tau. And then finally, there's another six singlets, which is what we would expect for all of the anti-leptons. <laughs> 
So we started with the complex octonions. We had them act on themselves repeatedly. This generated a 64 complex dimensional space, which is the Clifford algebra CL6. Within that algebra, we were able to identify SU3 generators. And we used those SU3 generators to act on the rest of the space. We then found that the rest of the space broke down into exactly the SU3 representations we would expect for three full generations of quarks and leptons.